Good evening, everyone. My name is John Stewart, and I'm Associate Dean for Cultural and Community Engagement at FIU's College of Communication, Architecture, and the Arts, and I'm also the Executive Director of the Miami Beach Urban Studios, and I'm delighted to welcome you here tonight to On the Avenue Architecture. Um, it's a, a, a real um, pleasure and distinction to be located on Washington Avenue uh, with, along with, the Wolfsonian FIU and the Jewish Museum FIU. And with and we also have a very close neighbor in the Betsy Hotel, which is straddles Washington Avenue and Collins Avenue. And um, we're gonna start today with a kind of walk down the a virtual walk down the avenue, and we will be starting in the north, uh, near Lincoln Road, where the Miami Beach Urban Studios is. Mm -hmm. And I am delighted that we will be starting, um, actually in the image that you see on, on the screen in front of you, we'll be starting on the left and moving towards the right, just as you'd read the screen, we'll be starting with MBUS. And the first, uh, we're gonna have a brief conversation at each point along our journey from north to south along Washington Avenue. And uh, we're gonna start with uh, my colleague, and a wonderful friend, Eric Goldenberg, who's a fellow professor of architecture in FIU's uh, Department of Architecture. And Eric, I often call uh, and a kind of an, an apologist for some of the most fascinating and important architects of his generation. He's uh, written a book uh, that uh, is about uh, feedback and about the way in which we feel and experience architecture and the body and music and intersections of music and arts. And Eric just holds this very special place in this world. Uh, he holds a, a, a viewpoint that few others do. And he has a, an exhibition here at MBUS that sadly none of you are gonna be able to see at least in the, in the very near future. So I'm hoping Eric will give a little bit of information about his, uh, about his, beautiful, work, his beautiful show here and uh, talk to us a little bit about his work. Eric? Nice to see you tonight. Thank you. Thanks, John, for the introduction. And thank you uh, to our two other uh, host museums who are organizing with Embus this uh, uh, exhibition, uh, this presentation of exhibitions or events. And I'd like to share uh, with everyone these, um, some of the projects included in the, in the exhibition, which I call Feedback. And uh, it's currently on view at Ambas. And uh, I'm, I'm operating here both like in the book that John described in a previous book called Pulsation in Architecture, which was about rhythm. I play the role of both being a sort of editor and curator, but also including my own uh, design work. But the exhibition feedback uh, presents, um, let me share my screen first. Um, working. Yeah, so the exhibition feedback presents projects uh, that intensify our questions of identity in an increasingly technologically mediated environment. Um, it ranges in scale, uh, in experimentation with body wearables and human skin, all the way to architectural envelope skins and their capacity to respond to stimuli and sensors, creating productive feedback as well as challenging our own perception of space and self. Um, so I'd just like to jump directly to the works here. This is a project by Gubeng Ozel, who's based in LA. And it's a great project called um, Cypher. And Cypher is a robotic installation controlled by virtual reality. So what you're seeing here is both this enigmatic artifact connected to a human and which has it actually it's what we call a soft robotics it's, it's a membrane that inflates and deflates reacting to different proximity sensors and it's kind of reacting to what the person wearing this vr um, helmet is seeing which he or he is seeing the interior space of that strange artifact so it's both simultaneously spatial and also objectual it's like Kind of mapping these sort of synchronized realities. And it's also based on uh, machine learning because as these will be in different exhibitions, we'll be learning to predict humans' reactions and constantly generating this kind of feedback in the real and the virtual the object and the space. Um, another interesting example is the work of Banas Farahi. Uh, 
Benas has been using the you know fashion design and body wearables as their uh, place of experimentation. And in this case, the project Crest of the Gaze is an interesting interactive 3D printed body wearable that reacts to sensors that sort of map what's going on with the gaze of anybody looking at the wearer of the of the artifact. Um, it's uh, kind of like an emotive second skin that defines a new identity and defines uh, all sorts of interactions of roles and genders as, you know, all of a sudden uh, the body is kind of place for um, uh, perception, but also reaction that is mutually uh, affecting each other. So sure. another interesting, uh, also the NAS has done this other uh, work called Aurora, which is an interactive ceiling device uh, that maps, that has sensors, uh, uh, movement sensors and proximity sensors that allow this, uh, this uh, ceiling to protract and contract, uh, reacting to how the, the, the person moves in the space. So it's really about this kind of feedback, this kind of in-between, the substance of the in-betweenness of what are the actions and reactions of architecture and humans. Um, the interesting work of my colleague, uh, Filippo Nassetti, who's caught up with me, one of these architectural association uh, workshops at Embas uh, recently is his uh, project uh, done with this firm called MHOX uh, where I have done this project called Collagen Masks which is another case of a sort of like uh, prosthesis for the face that is able to deploy this kind of first of all kind of with an elaborate uh, scanning of, of, the, of the face and the emotive characteristics of the face is able to then deploy this kind of fibrous matter on top of the face, creating this mask that is then questioning the identity um, and, and, you know, create, converting the face in a sort of territory or a sort of landscape for the exploration of, of this kind of fibrous tectonics. Um, in line with this kind of similar type of uh, sort of body modification, body prosthesis is the fashion design of a very famous fashion, contemporary fashion design. Iris van Herpen and her work in collaboration with my friend uh, Nicolo Casas, who's an architect that has been working a lot with fashion designers. And they have created uh, these three dresses. The one is here and then there's two other ones uh, called Magma Dress, Magnetic, Magnetic Motion Dress, and uh, Hacking Infinity Dress. And these are somehow 3D printed, sorry, 3D printed uh, flexible materials that are uh, upon which they have uh, grafted these really interesting geometries, which one could suspect they're either sort of tattooed on the exterior, but also maybe tattooed from the interior, sort of reconceiving of the ways in which one can think about the body, the skin, and, and, and the ways in which it's dynamically uh, programmed to operate and kind of, re, kind of retune that relationship and kind of presenting in a certain way to, uh, to the viewers. Um, and this is where I'd like to introduce a little bit of my own work, my design work. This is a project of my firm Monad Studio with my wife Veronica and done in collaboration with two great uh, women. So this one, uh, women that you see on the top, is amazing artist, bionic pop artist, the Victoria. She has, she's an amputee. She has done a lot of work, different kind of projects that um, uh, provide her with different prosthetic legs. and. We decided to um, partner up with Anouk Wiprecht, who's an interactivity fashion tech designer, super cool lady too, and, and come up with this project that created a sort of um, uh, a, a sonic bustier, we call it, has these tasks which have sensors that allow her to program sounds and emit sounds, which then um, feedback to a DJ that sends more pre-programmed sounds, and she can tune in, modify, with sliders that are in the in inner part of these tusks, uh, as if they were like the wah-wah pedals of an electric guitar. So it's kind of interesting, the, the, the sheer spectacle of seeing her uh, expressing uh, the movement of her hands, expressing a new kind of uh, choreography, new kind of way in which the body is kind of animal, but it's also sensual, but it's technologically uh, modified. As well as we also designed a leg for her that has um, uh, has a way in which uh, the way in which she navigates the space and moves about uh, feedbacks into lights and certain sensors uh, on her leg and so these are uh, very it was a really challenging and very interesting project that allows us to allow us Monet Studio as architects to bring 
uh, our expertise then to not just design uh, envelopes or, or habitats for the body, but kind of retune and tweak, help to tweak and optimize and also add new performances for the body. So it's a great collaboration. Another great collaboration that we did recently was this project that we built in, in the Biennale of Buenos Aires, kind of a, as an extension of the many projects we have done with sound and music instruments, 3D printed ones that we printed at Ambas. Uh, with uh, hosted by our gracious uh, host today, John. Uh, also, um, so this project is a really interesting work that we've done in collaboration with Alessandro Melis and other people um, um, that have, um, it's called Borboleta and it's uh, an interactive sonic uh, installation it has several aspects to it um, where you see these kind of very interesting elements on the bottom which are um, live slime mold organisms, which uh, have the duration during the duration of the installation, which is up for about two weeks. This slime mold began to propagate this bacteria that's trying to find its own food. While uh, inside those spheres, we had microenvironments with insects and, and crickets, and um, and they all of that with sensors that constantly self-regulated and the temperature, the humidity and also some other sensors of proximity so that people moving about in this installation will be able to see their movements reflected in further uh, sounds uh, trickle. Um, and, and also we had these two guitars, you can see a bass guitar and electric guitar that at certain points a musician would you know, take out of this kind of sonic wall and play kind of feedback, literal sound feedback, like the techniques created by Jimi Hendrix to interface with this whole perceptual system. So the idea was that there are multiple scales implied here, the scale of the environment, but also the scale of potentially understanding these um, mutating um, organisms, the slime mold as potential generators for optimized geometries for the organization of the city. So that's when, what was on our mind. And in terms of other projects that deal with this kind of feedback, let's call it the feedback of ecological systems, uh, another really great project is our, our colleagues, Ecologic Studio, Claudia Pasquero and, and Marco Poleto, who have done this project called Ortus, uh, which is made of uh, colonies of uh, photosynthetic cyanobacteria. Uh, and, and it's on a biogel medium, which is inserted into a structure, and the structure is kind of subdivided and organized somehow to emulate coral, coral reef formations. And it's both for humans to traverse, but it also has this algae and this kind of uh, um, synthetic materials which are alive. So in a way, it's kind of very much uh, on the same vein of the project that we've done before, but they've also done other really interesting projects working with the London School, the Bartlett, and its Urban Morphogenesis Lab, where they create this kind of feedback environment uh, where they, they propitiated certain three-dimensional structures for the inhabitation of tarantulas that will, during a certain period of time, create their own webbings and kind of interfacing, interfering, this kind of uh, diagrid, which is typically used in contemporary office buildings and architecture. So this kind of resulting uh, structure was really enigmatic. And uh, just to call it something, sil silky morpho morphologies. Um, but we can see that, you know, it's really interesting when you I'm in this role of sort of editing work of colleagues as well as presenting mine and all of, all of a sudden you start to find certain kind of amazing similarities uh, but also coming from a different point or angle is the work of uh, Mariana Ibanez also from Argentina and Simon Kim who have created this which is none other than a typical uh, uh, grid of an office uh, space but this grid is allowed to be inflected by data and information from uh, different weather uh, and, and temperature and humidity of the environment and it's called actually strange weather that's what the project is called and it's really uh, tracking certain sort of moisture levels and, and being able to organize this uh, its geometry based on that so it's really kind of presenting a very weird I would say office space but one that is more about defined by by elements that have to do with our environment um, Another project is uh, this. I have the pleasure of including work of some of my colleagues from FIU, Biaina Bogosian. And uh, this is a, a project by her called Seeing the Air We Breathe. And it's really interesting because Biaina, which is a recent uh, uh, hire by, she just has joined our faculty recently. She's bringing a great 
expertise in terms of data visualization and the use of, of live sensors in different architectural environments to reveal all the ways in which one can understand the geometry and the spatial configurations that really exist uh, once we track all these different data and that serves as a base condition to begin to think of design. So that's kind of really another way in which we can think of uh, mediated environments. And uh, her work is, uh, she told me a really interesting anec anecdote that she's also a Columbia graduate like John and me and, and she was there when um, the pra uh, Francois Roche uh, with his practice New Territories was professor she really was dying to get on her on his studio and she for some reason that didn't happen but she definitely developed her own take on this but in the case of Francois Roche his work is very provocative and he's not just interested in the in the environment as kind of neutral uh, scape or what from, from which to retrieve data but you know, what he does is, is a test environment for an architecture of paranoid symptoms, as he calls it, using robotics to construct sentient environments as fabrication of the shelter of humans symptoms. symptoms. So it actually is a project that reformulates or tries seeks to reformulate an ethical aesthetic paradigm where philosophy, physiology, sexuality, quality, gender, and technologies are all intertwined. So it's also looking at how um, in even in, in, the, in, the, in the construction of these robotic um, tectonics, accepting all sorts of accidents and all sorts of minutiae that happens on the things that sort of go wrong, that are somewhat parallel to the kind of symptoms that a person uh, may feel. Um, and you, using all of that as information, in, in terms of Another project uh, that's kind of looking at emotive conditions. This is a project called Emotive City by um, Theo and Stephen Spiropoulos, who brothers that uh, lead this firm called Minima Forms in London. And Emotive City proposes a model for a city that can be reconfigured based on a collective intelligence, a city that can be rearranged and it can reconfigure itself um, based uh, on a mobile self-organizing framework. And the objective is to really humanize cities, to re be able to develop the kind of collective intelligence over time that allows to, for this system to be reconfigurable. So it plays out both as an installation, but also as a model of a larger reality. Um, and then this allows me to introduce some of the issues that have to do with new kinds of tectonics, emerging from robotics and, and, and parametricism, and this is the work of SPAM, uh, Matthias El Campo and Sandra Manninger, and they have developed this, which they call the, um, they call the particle hut, and it, they conceive of a different scale of cellular aggregation than the one we've just seen, uh, more at the level of skin or small components. They, create, they try to generate perceptual effects uh, that have to do with the discreti discretization, uh, the, sort of the, the idea of making the components really expressing their singularity, but also diffusing them into a kind of uh, atmospheric condition. There's just thousands of components, but it's sort of articulated in a way that can create a sort of metallic effect of a dazzling effect of a metallic forest. Um, and that's, you know, one of the main proponents or apologists, like John likes to use that word, for, for this idea of the component, the use of the discrete, the singular, unit as an aggregation is Jill Redson, also based in London and the Bartlett. And uh, Jill is a big proponent of stressing the discreteness, individuality of components um, to counter this preconceived notion that everything that is, you know, parametric is about continuous soft surfaces, like in the work of Zaha or Patrick Schumacher. So it's a kind of an interesting polemics coming out of this and proponing Proposing new kind of possible um, architectural expressions based on our available technologies. Uh, and in this project, uh, the Tallinn Biennale, which is the one we're seeing here, and his project inside um, the Royal Academy in London, uh, this installation, she explored it, she really explores a truly bottom up uh, tectonics. So instead of thinking, let's say, that now you have a super cool soft structure, it's all about how you turn it into discrete components and then are you able to build a soft structure. It's really beginning from the thousands of components seeing what kind of intelligence can they produce. Um, in the work of uh, a colleague from Tokyo and my former classmate at Columbia, um, Case Doyoda, he's practicing noise, has done this project for the Trinale in, Vienna, in Milano. It's a really cool pavilion where 
In this case, the discrete parts of these continuous patterns are presented in a way that you can never ever understand the reality, the reality that you're perceiving in the same way. There's multiple patterns that also because of the qualities of the material qualities of the reflective materials and ethereal materials appear and disappear with every single move that you make in the space. So these are real membranes, but it's thought of in a, in a sort of in, you know, in a kind of like ironic way to render a space that looks like you're in a virtual space, right? So it's kind of the opposite of Cypher, our first project that I showed earlier. And I don't want to abuse the time, but... Yeah, so I Eric, you, you know that in the real world, I always just jump up and say, okay, time's up, time's up. So you're there. What they, <laughs> you're there. A little this, is, this is the project, a project, excuse me, a project by Zaha Hadid, who also joined this exhibition um, with the, the project for... Um, for the airport in Beijing, where this is where you really see what the ultimate expression of many of us who grew in these uh, generations that are, where the digital affords a new complete sensibility, this is who is building it, right? The studio of Zaha Hadid Architects, and, and, and this is the way the project becomes sophisticated, and it's a really a, a, an awesome, astonishing experience, I believe, to be inside such a new kind of aesthetic, uh, it's a new kind of haptic condition of inhabiting this kind of curvilinear space, likewise in the tower, tower that they did uh, in Lisa Zoho in China. But I think that um, I wanted to end this and I'm bringing back a little bit of, of the provocation with the work of Mark, Gage, Mark Foster Gage. And this is his project for uh, 57th, 57th Street in, in New York, where really the, what, what we understand as discrete components producing an amalgamation or an assemblage are taken to the extreme where it's all about the exaggerated figural capacities of them who are then producing a completely singular building where there's no repetition or assimilation of components. Everything is, is the, taken to the extreme of producing difference, which is kind of almost the opposite of these. But anyways, I think we need to go down the avenue, right? Yes, well, no, thank you, Eric. That was amazing, an amazing tour and an amazing introduction to uh, Space Up North. And I just before we take our, our venture down, uh, down the avenue, I just wanted to take a moment to thank Susan Gladstone, who, who really kind of came up with this idea and was uh, introduced it to us as a way to bring together the three institutions. And actually, it's going to be now the four institutions. So Susan, just a quick shout out to you. I know we'll hear from you at the end um, and we'll be, we'll be at your place. Uh, um, when we when we go south of fifth, but uh, right now I'm um, I'm delighted to to transition from Eric's amazing mind blowing exhibition, which was just I'm still kind of reeling, to um, Alan Schulman's work at the Betsy. And Alan is one of uh, Alan. I've I've known you for a quarter of a century, and you are probably leaving the biggest imprint on the city of Miami Beach, perhaps even our own avenue right here of any architect, I think, uh, in town. And so I'd love it if you talk about the uh, Betsy. And it really, you're obviously, you're a professor at the University of Miami. You're a lot of things. You're a dad, you're a husband, you're all these things. So um, you're an amazing guy. So take it away. Thank you, John. Thanks. Well, um, Deborah Briggs asked me to say a few words about the Betsy. And I'm always happy to do that because uh, it's one of the, you know, wonderful projects that I've been uh, I'm pleased to have been engaged with in one way or another over the years, um, but also because it really, that uh, hotel tells so many stories, so many stories about the city um, and uh, bringing us uh, up to the contemporary time. So I thought I would just take you on a, I'm going to speak a little bit, uh, show just a couple images and then end with a brief um, two minute video. Um, so, you know, at its base, the Betsy and the Carlton Hotel, which is on Collins Avenue, um, are hotels. They're really part of the substance, the matter, the kind of the, the fabric uh, of Miami Beach. But, you know, what's great about the hotels of Miami Beach is that they've always functioned as so much more than uh, just places to stay or places to eat. You know, they've really sort of evolved uh, into, and in some ways were planned as, you know, social centers. And they exist in this really wonderful competitive urban fabric, um, maybe what Rem Koolhaas would call congestion. You know, it's, there's so many of them and they're so tightly spaced. Um, and they, uh, you know, they're very emblematic of, of, of many things. Um, and, you know, one of the wonderful stories that we got to engage by working on the Carlton Hotel here, 
which was connected to the Betsy on the other end of the alley is the sort of differential stories between these hotels as well. It was the, the Carlton, which was designed by one of the two uh, prolific architects of Miami Beach, uh, Henry Hohauser in 1937, which was, uh, you know, which is obviously sort of modernistic, um, was followed um, five years later by the Betsy, which is, um, looks completely different. It's a very uh, traditional uh, language, you know, probably explained as a patriotic uh, response to the to Europe at war, uh, and then eventually to the US uh, entry into that war. Um, and uh, so one of the interesting uh, challenges that we got to work on was how these hotels uh, connect with each other, um, which I'll come back to in a moment. But so the actual Betsy itself, um, which is behind the building that we're looking at here, was um, uh, redeveloped, I think, in maybe 2009 uh, by, uh, by Jonathan Plutzik and his family. Uh, and uh, with the architect Les Balance, and I wasn't really involved so much in the Betsy, but uh, starting around 2014, um, uh, the family came to us with the idea of expanding what they do across the alley, and therefore incorporating this building and, you know, amplifying uh, what they're about, which is, you know, not just a hotel as a hotel, but the hotel as a, as a cultural philanthropic platform. Uh, and so, um, you know, we had the opportunity to think about how hotel spaces could, could be adaptively used in all kinds of ways uh, as, uh, you know, performance spaces, as galleries, as meeting places, as informal meeting places, as quiet place, quiet reading places, as poetry reading places. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the substance uh, of the project. And, um, I just, some of the really great themes um, that we were able to engage here was, um, first of all, how to amplify all of those programmatic elements and make them public or semi-public in some way. Because um, this was great about these hotels is that they're very open and they're very accessible, right? Um, on the left here, you see the, the traditional Carlton on the right, uh, a new uh, addition that we built that fills in an empty parking lot, what was an empty parking lot. Um, one of the other themes here had to do with how the hotel begins to sort of open out into other public spaces, less well-known public spaces like the alleys. And so here we have the possible sort of triangular leftover space between the building and a, and a very underused kind of uh, space that people were using just to get to the beach uh, from Española Way and to kind of create a facade on that, on that alley, but also to kind of leverage out a, a small wing, which has a, a restaurant on one side, a kind of a ventanita on the other, and a and a poetry reading uh, space above that engages with that alley as well. So everything that happens in that uh, space uh, is really connected to, to what's going on in the alley. And then, you know, the other piece, which I mentioned earlier, which was about connecting these two hotels, the, the Betsy by Elmery Dixon and the, and the uh, Carlton by Henry Hohauser. And, you know, what's an appropriate way to connect these buildings especially in a context where the city really doesn't like to see any connections between historic buildings, especially ones that cross public rights of way. And so again, in that way of thinking that every thing we do can be, you know, in some way transformed into something else or can have multiple meanings, multiple interpretations, uh, the bridge that, that connects the two sides uh, of this project uh, really was kind of interpreted as a spheroid, something we call the orb, um, which is a kind of an enigmatic uh, object um, uh, facing that alley. Should also mention that um, uh, Jonathan and a family came uh, during the process with the idea that that platform facing the alley could be um, enclosed with uh, poetry, that poetry could be engraved into the walls uh, of the structure itself. Um, also so as to kind of um, uh, interact with uh, people coming up and down the alley. So um, finally, I'm just going to show you quickly a video that was produced for, I don't remember what, um, probably some awards submission. It's 
very quick, but it gives you an overview of the building. Sorry to set a somber tone here. So this idea that the cultural pieces of the hotel really are the platform on which all the public spaces are built is something we tried to interpret all around the building, on the roofs, under the building, between the buildings, in the courtyards, uh, as much as we as much as we could. Well, thank you. Alan, thank you for sharing that wonderful um, information about your work at the Betsy. We certainly all appreciate what the Betsy does for the arts and cultural community here in South Florida, particularly in Miami Beach. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Casey Stebman. I'm the acting director of the Wilsonian FIU. So we're moving a little further down the avenue to 10th Street. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Wilsonian, we are an art and design museum, which is focused on the modern age, drawing for connections between the past and today. Um, for our portion of today's program, we're going to be presenting a uh, performance by, sorry, Leone Garcia. Uh, this is a, he's a choreographer and dancer here in Miami. He spent a few months researching Miami Beach architecture and putting together this piece that we're about to play for you uh, that's inspired by the Art Deco forms that you find in the architecture that's all over Miami Beach. Uh, so it's really a, a celebration of the Art Deco architecture and dance. Um, certainly this piece continues to evolve. Um, Leone continues to make changes and improvements to the piece. Uh, this is a video of its debut in our lobby um, with the backdrop of our wonderful Norris Fountain uh, facade, um, theater facade, sorry, from the 1920s uh, for a backdrop. So let's enjoy Corporeal Decorum.
Okay, is it my turn? Uh, good evening, everyone, early evening. My name is Susan Gladstone, and I am the very proud executive director of the Jewish Museum of Florida, FIU. Very, very happy to share this program with the two other FIU locations on Washington Avenue, as well as the Betsy Hotel. We are located at the south end in what's now called Sophie, south of Fifth, on Third and Washington. Uh, and um, so we are the southern end of the wonderful Washington Avenue group of uh, museums and locations. And this evening, we're going to have a presentation by my colleagues, Nancy Cohen, the museum director, and Luna Goldberg, the museum educator. So it's my pleasure now to turn the program over to the two of them. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, as Susan mentioned, I am uh, Nancy Cohen, I'm the museum manager, and along with my colleague Luna Goldberg, who you'll meet in a moment, we're going to talk a little bit about the Jewish Museum of Florida FIU. And we're sort of taking a step back in time because we, we saw Eric Goldenberg's wonderful modern uh, artwork and, and the incredible postmodern dance from, from the Wolfsonian. And we're going to take a look at a building, actually two buildings, um, that house the Jewish Museum of Florida. We're, we're currently looking at a photograph. If you look at the building on the left, um, the, the building on the left was the first, was, was originally built in 1929, and it was the first home to Congregation Beth Jacob. And it was built in, on, on 3rd and Washington because at the time it was said the Jews could not own property um, south of, north of 5th Street, and that's why the location was picked. And the congregation was in the building um, for several years and population grew down in Miami Beach. And in 1936, or actually 1935, they broke ground on a new, the new building, which you see on the right-hand side here. Um, we'll see that photograph in a moment. And um, what's interesting, I love this picture because it really shows um, the, the old cars on Washington Avenue and um, look at all the people there waiting for the groundbreaking of this building. Um, the, the Jewish Museum of Florida is probably one of the only buildings on Miami Beach that has a basement. Still don't understand why with, with the ocean two blocks away, but we have a basement. It looks to me, I haven't, been, haven't had this verified, that the basement was dug and then this uh, deck was built on top to host the, um, host the groundbreaking. And it looks like they actually brought the, the old benches from inside the, the museum out here for the groundbreaking. And um, so the new building was built in 1936. And um, here's, here's both of the buildings. And if you, you look at both of the buildings, there's an area between the two buildings that later, um, when, the two, the, when the buildings were joined later, when it became a museum, that, that became another museum space. And um, Alan talked about having to adapt um, architecture for a, another use. And this building obviously had to be adapted. Um, the, and adapting it was not easy. Um, as, as Luna will show you in the photographs, the building originally was built with a sloping floor. And trying to put an exhibit into a, a museum with a sloping floor, of course, has its own challenges. And of course, it was built prior to um, lots of other codes that, that, we're all, that we all um, have to deal with now. So, so the building was restored in, um, in, in the early 1990s, and it was, it was, there was a tour going across the country called Mosaic, which was started by Marcia Josarevitz, the founding executive director of the Jewish Museum. And they were looking for a home, and this building had been abandoned, and um, it was really the perfect location for a Jewish museum. And Marcia, along with architect Ira Giller, uh, started a project to restore it. And um, it was restored, and in 1995, it opened to the public as the Jewish Museum of Florida. About eight years ago, we became part of FIU, so we're part of the FIU family. So I'm gonna turn it over to Luna Goldberg, who is going to talk about some of the architectural details, which you'll see inside the building. And, um, and again, thank you for having us today, and thank you for being part of this wonderful panel. Luna. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. And I'm going to be speaking a little more about some of the architectural elements that are really special to our building. So we've already heard our first mention this evening of Henry Hohauser, and he was the architect who designed 
this building in 1936. And when he designed this building, it was really interesting because of the way that he combined different architectural elements of the Art Deco style, but also elements specific to Jewish faith because this was an Orthodox synagogue. So this is a really lovely image where we can see this marriage of these elements. And this is the Northern exterior of the building. So we have these stars of David in the center of these friezes. You can recognize this color palette, very typical of Art Deco at the time. And then the other element that's really interesting to note are these stained glass windows. Now the stained glass windows in our building, we have about 80 of them. They were not original to the design that Hohauser uh, created. They only came in the 40s. And when they came to the building, it was because of one invention in Miami Beach, which was air conditioning. Originally, we didn't have air conditioning. And at the time, uh, what they did is they would leave these windows open so that air could circulate. But there was also sand blowing around. We have oral histories about the rabbi of the congregation who had to shout so loudly that you could hear him blocks away. And the other element that brought in the windows was that the worshipers who were there with their prayer books, they were blinded by the light. So these stained glass windows were a way of shielding the light a bit and also bringing these Jewish symbols um, into the building. And I'll show you more in a few minutes. Here are some images of the original interior. And Nancy already mentioned these sloping floors. So this sloping floor, it was able to create an amphitheater effect that helped project sound in the building. We also have um, this bima over here, this stage, which is another interesting element because it was actually designed by the rabbi. It didn't come to the building until the 40s and he originally carved it out of soap and it was later made into um, into marble carved into marble and installed and here we can see the windows were already installed so we know these images are coming after the the 40s the other element that i'll note is this balcony and because this was an orthodox space men and women sat in different areas. So the men were on the bottom floor in these pews and the women and children were up top. And in our, in our building today, which I'll show you, um, you'll see that we've converted this area into our administrative offices. One last thing I'll point out is where my, my cursor is over here. These doors led to an exit. And I mentioned them because when worshipers came to pray, oftentimes they purchased their seats. And this seat over here, right by the door, belonged to an infamous congregant, which many of you might know, um, Meyer Lansky. So I'll show you more in a few. But I do also want to point out this dome, which was a Moorish copper dome installed in 1936 with the original building. And here we also have a nice view of this Art Deco chandelier, also merging these Jewish elements, the Stars of David at the top. And um, the dome we actually restored just last year, adding this new Star of David. Now here we have the window uh, that was purchased by Meyer Lansky. When the congregation was fundraising for these windows, uh, they had a whole different group of, of people that were involved. There were young women who uh, prepared a play and they sold tickets to be able to purchase these windows. Other generous contributors who might have had a little more money at the time. And we even have this great story in our archive about an older woman who didn't have much money. Nobody knew where she had her money from. And it turns out that she would sit outside a space called the Copacabana. 
And these men that would go into gamble, they called her their lucky star. So whenever they, they came into the building to, to go and gamble, they would give her a few bucks. And with that money, she was able to purchase a window as well. I also want to point out these scallop trimmings here that are typical to Art Deco style. And this is the first close look that we've gotten at our windows. So each one of them, which were again designed by the rabbi of the congregation, they involve different symbols. Here we have a grapevine and we also have a pomegranate plant. And these are elements that are very important in Jewish tradition, but we also have these wonderful windows that show astrology signs. So we have a Libra and Leo, and we get questions about them all the time because of how they fit into the Jewish calendar. Now I'll end here with two more elements of interest. And the first is this light over here. And this is a candle, which in many um, Jewish spaces of worship, what it's called the eternal light. And they're always lit. Now this is an element that we've kept in the museum, although today it's never lit. It's, it's just there as a historic object. And the last thing I'll point out, which we get many questions about, is this half star of David. We saw in, in this previous image, we can see a whole one on uh, the foundations and these pillars. But in the corners of our building, we have these fragmented stars of David. And really this is part of the architectural design of the building at the time. There's no real reason that I've come across in my time at the museum, but it is a beautiful detail and again, showcases this, this marriage between our deco style and Jewish tradition. And with that, I'll hand it back to our executive director, Susan Gladstone. Susan, you're muted. Muted, so sorry. Thank you so much, Luna and Nancy, uh, for showcasing our beautiful building. I'm sorry that we are still not open, but we look forward to being able to host you um, as soon as possible. And I just want to mention um, that you can read more information about um, the Jews of Florida, but also specifically about our building in uh, this book, Jews, um, Jews of Florida by Marcia Dozer. It's the uh, founding executive director of the museum, and it is available on our website. And um, I would just like to take this opportunity to thank everybody involved in this, in this evening's program. I want to thank my own colleagues, Nancy Cohen and Luna Goldberg, along with Colette Mello from the Miami Beach Urban Studios and Oscar Reveling from the Wolfsonian for organizing everything. And then of course our panelists, John Stewart from Miami Beach Urban Studios, Eric Goldenberg, from also Miami Beach Urban Studios, Casey Stedman, the uh, interim director of the Wolfsonian, um, Alan Schulman and Deborah Briggs from the Betsy Hotel. And I believe that brings us to the end of our tour of Washington Avenue. Thank you so much for joining us. And please look forward to a second or third uh, round of a uh, visit uh, on the Avenue with a different topic and theme coming in the future. Thank you so much. Good night.